Welcome to New York Nonprofit Media. My name is Jeff Stein, and I'm here with Ruth Milkman from the CUNY Graduate Center, professor of sociology at the Murphy Institute, and a research director there. And we're so excited that you could come in today, especially given the really timely uh, discussion about the push for a $15 minimum wage. Um, and I, I wanted to tap your expertise, um, putting that movement in perspective with some past labor movements that I know you've studied extensively. So maybe would you be willing to sort of um, put that in historical context? You know, uh, do, you, do you think that this push um, represents a revitalization of labor movements in, in New York right now? Um, I don't know if it's revitalization exactly, but it's certainly a you know, campaign that's got a lot of legs and that a lot of people are supporting, including recently the governor, which was not the case at the beginning. So mm -hmm. it's been, it looks like it's a pretty successful campaign so far. We haven't had so many of those in recent years. So in that sense, you could call it revitalization. I mean, New York is different from the rest of the United States in that unionism is still relatively strong here. It's roughly double the unionization rate of the nation's average. And so um, it's not the same as some other parts of the country in that mm -hmm. respect where, you know, unionism is in the single digits and you know, very, very marginal to what goes on here. There's still some clout, and so I think that's part of what mm. is happening. So if this does come through, the minimum wage, the statewide minimum wage thing, which is still a big if, because, right. you know, it's not clear that there's much enthusiasm in the Senate. Um, it would be the first state, though, to do that. So there have been quite a few cities that have gone that route, but not yet a full state. So it's a pretty big deal if it happens. Right. You know, what, what do you think that this movement can learn from past labor movements that have gotten really big concessions out of state and local governments? Well, so I see this a little differently. I think this is kind of a hybrid movement that draws on the history of conventional unionism that you're talking about, but at the same time draws on the work of the um, community-based organizations and worker centers that have been active both in New York and around the country in the last couple of decades. And what I mean by that is, um, they have used very different um, approaches than labor movements typically do in, have in the past in that it's true that in the case of the fast food workers there is a demand for unionization but that isn't really the focus. This is about you know, exposing inequality, exposing low wage work and its problems, um, making poster children of some of the people who are most affected by that and calling you know, public attention to the problem and trying to get remedies. So the remedy in this case is not unionism directly. I mean, it may help promote mm -hmm. unionism down the road. And I think in the case of fast food, that's certainly what the service employees are hoping will happen. But it's not, they don't have a single union member as a result of this, actually. So that's much more like this other movement that's emerged in recent years, which is more focused on low wage work, super exploitation, sub minimum wages sometimes. Um, and so I think even though this campaign is mostly financed by the SEIU, by a, by a traditional labor union, it's sort of taking a page from that other movement. And I think that's what's unique about it and interesting. And maybe that's also part of why it's been as successful as it has. Yeah. And, and given that it's in this transitional period right now, it's unclear whether or not um, the concessions will be won, whether or not they will be won with support from the legislature or a unanimous action by the governor. You know, what tactics do you think would be most successful for the movement to employ? Well, I'm not really the right one to answer that, but what I can say is I think they've used a kind of combination of tactics, which is usually the most effective these days. So it's a mix of what we sometimes call top-down organizing, that is putting direct pressure on the governor and on legislators to try to make this happen, and at the same time bottom-up mobilizing people in the streets and, you know, and in the workplace. And putting those two together is often more effective than either one by itself. Labor movements traditionally have often done just one or the other. And in recent years anyway, the ones that, the campaigns that are the most successful tend to try to cover all fronts. Right. Um, and so they've done that here. Um, and they have had some victories, even if the minimum wage thing doesn't come through, which I think is definitely a possibility that we'll see. Um, they did get the wage board thing for the $15 for fast food workers, which is all by itself a very significant victory. So I feel like, you know, it's a lot going on. And it's not just in New York, this campaign, of course. 
the, the $15 um, statewide minimum wage would be a New York thing, but this campaign is a national campaign and it's made a lot of impact around the country, not just here. So um, I think, I know your focus is on New York, but yeah, you know yeah. we shouldn't forget that it's a big country. And um, yeah. so New York has both benefited from that momentum that exists nationally and also contributed to it, I think. Hmm. Do you think that, um, get, you know, given the fact that New York has, as you said, higher levels of unionization than other parts of the country, how, how is that translated into a uh, difference in terms of, um, you know, the average lives of, of workers? Well, so even in these times, and it's not as true as it was in the past, but still today, if you're unionized, you're much more likely to get paid decently. You're much more likely to have things like pensions and employer-provided health insurance and mm -hmm. all that. So having double the national unionization average and unionization, sorry, the national average in unionization rates means you're twice as likely if you live in New York to have those things. That's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the most single most important thing. And I think, you know, it's also part of a longer historical tradition here in New York where the labor movement has had a big impact on politically on um, social provision for things like public housing, um, education, health care, provided by the government as well. Um, so it's still very inadequate, but compared to the rest of the United States, we do pretty well in things like transit and um, mm -hmm. public housing and all the rest of it. I mean, I'm not saying those things are great because right, they've been um, eroded quite dramatically over the decades recently. but. Um, historically, New York was a leader in all those areas, and that's partly because of the strength of its labor movement. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I think is kind of interesting about the, especially in the minimum wage fight, is that you know, sort of dovetails a lot with um, with racial uh, elements. You know, so uh, one of the advocates who was here earlier mentioned that you know, so many of, especially in the human services sector, so many of the workers who make less than fifteen dollars uh, an hour are you know, predominantly women, predominantly women of color. Um, yes. You know, how have those, how have labor unions um, and labor movements been able to more adequately address concerns of those marginalized populations? Well, so that's a great question. Well, so there's sort of, the labor movement is um, segmented just as the workplace is. So women and men, for example, are not evenly distributed through all occupations. Take the building trades, which are overwhelmingly male. Mm -hmm. There are hardly any women there. The public sector, on the other hand, which is the most highly unionized sector we have, is very female and includes lots of the people of color, the workers you just mentioned. So that's where you see the big, um, you know, protection possibilities in terms of unionization is for women and people of color is mostly in the public sector. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the one sector that remains, you know, pretty strong in terms of organization right now in the face of lots of attacks on private sector unionism over the recent decades, including here in New York, where, you know, there's still more organization than elsewhere, but it's, got, it's way lower than it was 30 years ago. This question is also related to um, what we were talking about before in terms of the non-traditional labor movement's efforts mm -hmm. to which have focused a lot on immigrant workers, for example, which have not been traditionally well represented by traditional unions. Um, and actually, the gender gap in unionization rates has pretty much closed just because of the decline of the private sector and the rise of the public sector. And actually, African Americans are more likely to be unionized for the same reason than white workers, um, partly because they're overrepresented in the public sector, which is the most unionized sector. So it's kind of there are a lot of moving parts here. But the focus on low wage work per se really does come from that um, community-based organizing tradition of the worker centers and whatnot, um, mm -hmm. which again, I think this campaign is you know, very much indebted to. Um, there's one more string historically that I would want to mention here yeah. too, which is I think you can draw a straight line from this campaign for both the Fist Food Forward campaign and the broader minimum wage campaigns, the Fight for 15, as they both together have been called, mm -hmm. um, to Occupy Wall Street which was um, many of the organizers came directly out of Occupy. And of course, that was the turning point in terms of raising public awareness of inequality and the need to do something about the working poor and low wage work and so on. So you know, that's just another connection. So there's really three legacies here. There's the traditional labor movement, there's the worker center movement, and there's Occupy. And they've all contributed energy and you know, ideas to this whole initiative, yeah. I think.
Yeah, so speaking about sort of where social movements are going, I, you mentioned before the uh, before the interview that you know you're looking at some of the movements that have been inspired by the millennial generation. Mm -hmm. You know, looking forward, what do you think uh, we'll see out of millennials in terms of uh, campaigns about inequality, about higher wages, all these issues? Well, I've learned the hard way that it's hard to predict the future, but I'm very encouraged by what's happened so far. I, you know, this generation, if you look at the survey data, has very progressive attitudes about a whole range of issues, not just same-sex marriage, which is kind of the famous one, but everything to do with immigration, unions, uh, marijuana legalization, um, pretty much any issue you name, millennials are to the left of their elders. And, um, and they've not just have the attitudes, but, you know, taken to the streets to some extent to show that. So, Occupy was uh, the demographic that was the most represented. There was millennials. Black Lives Matter is the same. There's the um, immigrant millennials who are, have organized the Dream, Dreamers movement, the young women who are campaigning against sexual assault on college campuses. These are all um, millennial-fueled movements, and I think, I, I like to think they represented what we call in sociology a new cycle of protest. That is a, a new wave of social movements that are trying to you know, address inequalities. One other thing that's really interesting about all these movements is they all speak the language of intersectionality. They see all these issues as connected to one another. Not They're not just single issue movements. So the Dreamers, for example, directly um, analogize their own situation to that of um, sexual minorities. They say they're coming out the same way mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, gay people and, and, uh, and trans people have come out of the closet. They have come out and announced their undocumented status. So that kind of thing. And they actually, many of the leaders are um, self-identified as queer and whatnot. Same in Black Lives Matter. There's a lot of that. So it's interesting. I think they, they kind of connect the dots between issues that, in my generation, were often seen as sort of distinct, separate things. Interesting. Um, well, we'll look forward to your research on those future movements. And thanks so much for being here. Uh, well, thanks for having me.